During the 80s and 90s, there was this mysterious and confusing thing called the Information Superhighway. An information Superhighway. Information Superhighway. Information Superhighway. It's just, yeah, the internet. They're just, they're, they're talking about the internet. By combining the telephone, computer, and television, the telecom and media industries had a futuristic dream to bring one super product to consumers. One otherworldly entertainment system where you could watch movies, video chat, and shop online from your home. However, one by one, these smart TV-esque products curiously failed. What the telecom and media industries overlooked was a passionate group of early World Wide Web users that weren't as interested in consuming content as they were in creating and sharing their own content. These same hackers and early adopters are the ones responsible for creating a community that effectively rerouted the masses from this corporate super system and onto the World Wide Web themselves, creating an internet made by the people. But the whole story is certainly much more complex than that. There are countless fascinating communities around the world, which we are always seeking to explore. One group of communities that is often overlooked but shines particularly well during, say, a pandemic, are the internet's most fascinating communities. most astounding fact that the atoms of footage you are seeing is unedited. What if the U.S. paid off the journey of the rocket equation? The Internet. Possibly humankind's greatest creation. While there are dark sides, the internet allows us to instantly share information and pass on knowledge, benefiting all of humanity. Do we compare it with, uh, with having water and healthcare? Yes, we do. And it gives us these. It's like a TikTok, you know, like... Candy for breakfast? No, Mom, it's Reese's Puff cereal. Are you freaking stupid? TikToks, memes, GIFs, YouTube. Wow. Oh my God. It might all seem trivial, but it is a huge part of our culture. While the internet is a massive void of information, it's also this complex thing that allows us to talk and hang out with each other. Well, it's not a thing, but a place. And this place wouldn't be a thing without community. The small communities, big communities, huge communities, strange communities, but most importantly, the first communities. One of those first communities were people that used bulletin board systems, or BBS. This community was a group of people that hacked into their phone lines, connected their home computers, and communicated amongst each other for the first time ever. This group was originally comprised of computer programmers, but broke into the mainstream throughout the 80s and 90s, until these same people introduced us to the World Wide Web. This program you'd have on your computer, you'd dial a number, and you'd enter your name and password, and it would say hello, and then you could go to the messages and you could read these messages, and then you could add one. I say it's kind of like America Online, but really scaled down, you know? Yeah, I'd be telling you know, my relatives, I'm like, so this is, I, I, I would dial up and I'd be talking to other people online, but not really talking, I'd be typing, and, and leave the messages, and then later I can read more messages, and they all go, oh, okay, and they look, like you've got some sort of disease or something. Uh-oh, here it comes again. A snow warning is a reminder to take special measures for the winter ahead. The story of how we got here goes way back. Let's start in 1978, in Chicago. It's New Year's Eve. There's a blizzard. A blizzard that brings down 8.5 inches of snow. Then, a few days later, another snowstorm hit. This time, much bigger. The blizzard of 79, they call it. Over 29 inches total dumped on the metropolis. If anybody had organized a more powerful storm, or had meant to, they couldn't have done a better job. Hundreds of restaurants were haunted by no-shows. Airports were shut down. 
and businesses closed. The city was brought to a standstill. People couldn't really go anywhere or do anything. Or so we thought. There were some who adapted. All right, should we get going? Let's go. Let's pick it up from the blizzard of 79. What happened during that shut-in? Randy Seuss is a hardware hacker. Really gruff guy, engineering type. Loves smashing things into other things with wires. Ward Christensen is a IBM engineer. And when the snowstorm hit, the great blizzard of 78, in Chicago, Ward couldn't get to work. And he was talking to Randy and said, you know, maybe I have a little extra time to get started on this. And the idea was, what if we did like an answering machine that you could call the computer and it would let you leave some messages on it and others could read it. It'd be like a bulletin board that we keep down at the community center when we have our meetings. Many people now use computers for personal, educational, business, and entertainment purposes. But most people are not aware of the possibility to connect their home computer to another in the outside world to share a vast resource of information and data. This is made possible through a service known as a bulletin board system, or BBS. So there's computer bulletin board-like things, but they're all in the hands of government and companies, and they're very guarded, and misusing them is a fireable offense or a national security disaster. What Ward and Randy said was, we should do that with the stuff we're just buying. So that was called CBBS, and they hacked it together in about two weeks during a snowstorm in Chicago. What I have next to me is uh, the first uh, bulletin board in the world, uh, CBBS Chicago. Uh, people wondered if the C stood for Christensen or Chicago or whatever, and uh, no, it didn't because there was no such thing as a BBS, so it was a computerized bulletin board system. A bulletin board was the first time that you could reach out to others and communicate with them and get an answer back, and you didn't have to know each other beforehand. But there's something very special about knowing that there's a machine sitting in a room somewhere with a phone and it's waiting for you. And if the phone line isn't busy, uh, an entire world awaits. saying, hey, if you call my computer, my bulletin board system, my BBS, I'll, uh, you know, have something there for you. Maybe some of them would have a theme, a sports theme, or a computer repair theme, or Apple computers, or Commodore computers. You know, it was whatever that person wanted to make their personal bulletin board system be to others. The other people connecting to the bulletin board system are nearby probably within 10 to 20 miles. Uh, there'll be somebody who connects in who's weird from another state or, or from another country. But those are like honored guests who stopped in into your little bar. That's amazing that your friend had a you know buddy from you know Florida and they called in. But it would normally just be that everybody was local. And that meant that you could say, hey, next Saturday, would you all like to meet at Miller's Pizza? And then at like two or three in the afternoon, a bunch of people would kind of wander into a pizza place looking around nervously and see people and be like, don't tell me, wait a minute, are you, are you the saw man? 
Yeah. They'll be like, yeah, are, are, you, are you Mr. Q? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm Mr. Q. Awesome. Yeah, just, look, just call me Jake. Just call me Jake. And uh, suddenly these become close friends. And yeah. you might then go to each other's house to trade software or work on a problem. Well, you know, they want more people there. So come on down, guys. All my PBS guys. And, you know, it'd be great. I was like, I don't really understand. I mean, I know it's like a machine in a room. And it sends text through the phone lines to another machine in a room. But, like, how does that actually work? You know, like, does somebody have to be there to answer the call on the other end? Is it a call? Like, what, what is that? The way that computer bulletin board systems work is that there is a thing called a modem, a modulator demodulator, which is just referring to the ability to communicate over a phone line. Take data in, make it into a sound hear a sound, turn it back into data. That's all it is. Hmm. Uh, it was a hybrid of hackery and technology. Within a year, modems can auto answer as it's called. At its peak, there were over 12,000 bulletin board systems, meaning that there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users around the world. If you have one of these and you have one of these, but you don't have one of these, you're missing half the fun of owning a computer. This is a modem, and with it you can turn your computer into a window on the world. Through bulletin board systems, people primarily communicated via messaging and forum-like applications. But there were also games, news, role-playing sites, and so much more. It was truly the beginning of the internet as we know it. Unlike a fundamental human aspect, because computers are so non-human they're about as non-human as you can get why do you think people were so attracted to bbs in the first place so when you think about our relationship to computers especially now in kind of the social media and mobile phones and gps era where they're always with us like all of these urges are now super served by things like the internet websites social media well those urges in some extent, live in us throughout all of human history. You know, having a group, a friend, a tribe that you can depend on, uh, it's always been there for us. Yeah. And what computer bulletin board systems did was it removed for the first time that geographic limitation. You could now connect to a bulletin board system, leave a message, and within a few days, probably have a couple people get back to you with a sense of knowing it, you know? A lot of bulletin board history is making humans comfortable with talking to machines <laughs> or through machines. Yeah, it's, it's so weird. It's especially weird because communication is so like primitive to who we are as humans. But when you actually look at what was going on, it was somebody in a room totally alone that's communicating through phone lines. You know, it's it's weird. It's actually it's actually not too much different from what we're doing right now, really. You know. Oh yeah. No, like if you look at a lot of how we set up things with computers, and a lot of people can't imagine it any other way. A certain kind of keyboard layout, a certain kind of arrangement. The idea, the idea that almost everybody has heard the term BIOS or upgrade at this point to be able to function. I think there's all these economic reasons why we ended up that way. The arrangement of uh, keypads were because they analyzed 250,000 people in the 50s to figure out, could we do push buttons instead of a dial? Now our phones give us these keypads that date back 60 years and they are designed for a certain length of rest because we did analysis 50 years ago over what human beings expected. There's so many traces going back. This isn't something that we dropped on ourselves. Uh, you know, two years ago, and we're all used to it now. Like, we've spent a century figuring out what keyboard layouts people can stand. And in the same vein, when you consider what the internet is today, much of that can be traced to the unification of computer-to-computer -computer communication through bulletin board systems. 
and the simple yet revolutionary idea of Ward and Randy. What the blizzard did was the blizzard gave him the time to think and the time to build the framework of what became the first bulletin board system. He got started. You know, let's not mythologize it as he emerges from his snowbound igloo with a fully formed finished item. You know, it took weeks, but he had gotten started. He made the first draft. He wrote mm -hmm. the first notes of what became the symphony. And as BBS spread around the world, a few entrepreneurs got their hands on it and created Usenet, which led to many, many discoveries and experiments that changed the world. Like an email attachment. Well, yeah, that was that was the first email attachment yeah. was UUN code.